Hi, welcome to the third episode of my series Amiga Hardware Programming in C. In this episode I will explain how to use the Amiga Playfield hardware to display image information that is stored in chip memory. I will also show how to convert image data from a modern image format into a form the Amiga needs in order to display it. The Amiga supports a number of display modes that I am introducing here briefly. Please note that I am only listing the OCS graphics modes. The ECS and later the AGA chipset introduce a number of additional modes. The standard graphics modes can support up to 32 colors with a screen resolution of 320 by 200 for NTSC displays or 320 by 256 for PAL displays. There is also a high resolution mode with 640 by 200 NTSC and 640 by 256 for PAL and both high res and low res modes have an interlaced variant which allows to double the vertical resolution to 400 or 512 pixels at the cost of effectively halving the vertical screen refresh rates, which means 50 Hz down to 25 Hz for PAL and 60 Hz down to 30 Hz for NTSC. The Amiga display hardware also supports two special color modes, namely Extra Half Bright, which allows for 64 colors, and Hold and Modify, which supports 4096 colors and is great for displaying photos and ray traced images. Finally, there is the so-called overscan mode, which allows the Amiga to utilize the border area of the display for graphics as well. Due to how the copper was designed, it is possible to display different display modes at the same time. This allows for intuition screens with different resolutions and color depths and show them at the same time by dragging down a screen title bar. I think this is a good time to introduce a central concept in the Amiga's hardware design, namely the Direct Memory Access or short DMA. This is a technology which allows the custom hardware to access the chip memory and perform a lot of their operations in parallel to the system's CPU without affecting its performance most of the time. I say most of the time because certain configurations will cause the CPU to wait when it needs to access chip memory. For example, the blitter and copper are the components which can interfere with the CPU, so as programmers we need to take this into consideration when we design our programs. In order to take advantage of DMA for a certain feature the custom hardware provides, there is typically a general pattern. We have to set the appropriate bit in the DMA con register to enable the type of DMA feature we want to use. In addition, a number of those features require you to enable or disable sub-features, for example like in our case the bit planes we want to use. Oftentimes, we also have to describe the structure of the data, which typically is done through writing values to certain registers or can sometimes be in the data itself, such as for sprites or copper lists. Finally, we also need to specify the location of the data that is supposed to be read by writing its address to the dedicated registers. Since all registers have a size of 16 bits, there is a high and a low word registers for each of such addresses. Let's have a look at the Amiga's display again. As I have mentioned in the last episode, it's best to picture the conceptual model of a CRT display, where an electron ray moves quickly from left to right and top to bottom for one frame, and there are 50 frames per second for PAL and 60 frames per second for NTSC. While the ray is moving, it builds the display pixel by pixel in a grid of a predefined resolution according to the display mode. In order to define a play field, we will also need to define the colors at each pixel in the display. The way that we can represent color information with the Amiga hardware is typically planar graphics, which means that conceptually the image information is stored in data blocks that are called bit planes. By layering these bit planes on top of each other, the display hardware can combine the data into a value for each pixel position. This value is an entry into a color table defined in memory. Let's see which Amiga hardware registers are involved in setting up a single playfield display. First take a look at BPLCon0 one of three so-called bitplane control registers. The other bitplane control registers come into play when dealing with dual playfields and sprites, which we will talk about in a later episode. 
In this episode, we are primarily interested in the bits that define the resolution and the number of bit planes. This example shows the configuration for a low resolution, non interlaced single play field display with 5 bit planes. The DIW start and DIW stop registers define the display window dimensions. When defining the display window, we should be aware whether we are on a PAL or NTSC system because the vertical size is different in each respective case. The display window registers are structured in a way that the upper 8 bits define the vertical position and the lower 8 bits define the horizontal position. If we recall from the previous episode that there are 262 lines in NTSC and 312 in PAL, as well as 452 horizontal low resolution positions, we realize that 8 bits are insufficient to represent all possible screen positions. To deal with this issue, the hardware designers define additional rules so that the positions in DIW start are restricted to the upper two-thirds of the display in vertical direction and the left three-quarters in horizontal direction. In order to define the higher positions with DIW stop, if the highest bit in the 8 bits that define the vertical position is not set, 256 will be added to the final position and if it is set, the value will be taken as it is. In horizontal direction, 256 will always be added to the final value. The hardware reference manual recommends a value of hex 2C81 for DIW start and hex 2CC1 for DIW stop on a PAL screen. For an NTSC screen, it is hex F4C1. It is explained that these values center the display window on a normal size display, which means a regular 4x3 CRT of the mid-1980s. Here I have written down which concrete screen positions these register values correspond to and how you can calculate those for yourself. The DDF start and DDF stop registers define during which DMA cycles on a horizontal line image information is fetched. Only the six highest bits of the lower register half are used, which means we have a resolution of four DMA slots or four color clocks. The reference menu explains the relationship between the display window start and DDF start as DIW start dot x divided by two minus 8.5 for low res and DIW start dot x divided by two minus 4.5 for high res. So if we take our horizontal starting position 129, using this formula, we will get a DDF start value of hex 38. The relationship between DDF start and DDF stop is DDF stop is equal to DDF start plus 8 times the number of data weights minus 1 for low res and DDF stop is equal to DDF start plus 4 times the number of data words minus 2 for high res. In our case, we have a display window width of 320 pixels. We have defined DDF start as hex 38 or 56. For a horizontal resolution of 320 pixels, we have 320 divided by 16 equals 20 words per line, so 56 plus 8 times 19 equals 208 or hex D0. To define how the display hardware accesses image data, we also need to look at the registers BPL1 mod and BPL2 mod. These two registers define the so-called bitplane modulus, which means the number of bytes that are to be skipped after the display hardware has read a line of the bitplane. I will show a few examples how to use these registers. The first example shows the simplest memory configuration. The bitplanes are arranged one after another and each bitplane is exactly the same size as the display window. In this case, the modular registers are both set to zero. The second example shows a case where the bitplanes are arranged in a way that their rows are interleaved. That means one line of a bitplane follows a line of the previous bitplane. To tell the display hardware about this configuration, we need to set both modular registers to a value that skips the next four lines of data in order to continue with the next line of the current bitplane. This configuration is useful when we are copying rectangular areas of images around. I will demonstrate this in a later episode about the blitter. 
Example 3 demonstrates the case where the image in memory is wider than the display window. In this case, we have to tell the hardware to skip the number of bytes that each bit plane is wider than the display window. In this example, each bit plane is 640 pixels wide, which means each plane is 300 pixels wider, which is 40 bytes or hex 28. I should point out that in practice, you will have cases where you mix both interleaved bit planes and wide images so you will have to set the bitplane modulus accordingly. In order to tell the hardware where the image information is located, there is a set of dedicated registers, the bitplane pointer registers. On the OCS hardware, there are six pairs of them, which are responsible for holding the address for one bitplane each, split into a high word and a low word of 16-bit. Depending on how much chip memory your system supports, only a certain number of those bits are actually used. Finally, since each pixel within our combined bit planes define an index into a color palette, we need to actually define the entries of that palette. This is done through the color registers and the original chipset defines 32 of them. As expected, those are 16 bit wide, but only 12 bits of those 16 are actually used. 4 bits each to define red, green and blue intensities that are combined to a final color value. Now that we have covered all the topics that are necessary to display image data using the Amiga hardware, let's start designing a program that is doing exactly that. I have outlined the necessary steps and will explain the steps a bit more in detail except initialization and cleanup because they are pretty much the same as seen in the previous episode. Nowadays, most images are stored in a standard image file format like PNG. But in order to display this data on Amiga hardware, it needs to be prepared in a way that it can understand it. We could add functionality to directly read PNG and you can certainly do so. However, I personally think it is more efficient to convert the data in a form that can be directly used by the custom hardware. I wanted to introduce a suite of utilities that I created for my own projects and published so they can be used for this course. You don't need them for your own projects if you don't want to, but the programs that I am writing for this course are using these tools for data conversion. I have used Retro Make Tiles in order to convert images stored in PNG format. In its simplest form, the tool takes a PNG file and generates an image file of the specified name. Retro Make Tiles creates an image file in tiles format, which means it is actually image information plus a description of how this image is divided in a grid of rectangular tiles. The reason I decided to use a tile format is that it can be used for different things in a game, such as level tiles and game objects. This flexibility will come in handy in later episodes. Shown here is the structure of a tiles file and how it maps to a C structure. For the most part, things are arranged in a way that they can be directly processed by the Amiga custom hardware, so all we need to take care of is that the data gets put in the memory locations where it can be used. The most straightforward way to set up a display is to define a copper list. This is essentially a recipe to tell the copper what we want to do in each frame. This also frees the CPU for program logic tasks while the copper is our reliable helper that coordinates the custom hardware at a reliable pace. As you can see in this copper list, the display related registers we discussed are initialized at the top to set up a low resolution 5 plane display and there are placeholders for the color palette and the bit plane addresses that we can set to their final values after we have read the image file into memory. The main program itself is really simple. It reads the image, copies the palette values and bit plane addresses into the copper list, activates it and waits for the mouse button. The shown example is for non-interleaved data, so each individual plane's data follows another and the bit plane modulus are set to zero. I also have deactivated sprite DMA here to prevent some graphics artifacts to be shown. I have provided the complete program as well as an interleaved variant in the course's GitHub repository. And this is how it looks like after you compiled it and run it on an Amiga system.
With a few small additions, we can tell the copper to display a split screen. In a real-world program, we would create a separate memory area for each half of the screen. Here we simply point at the start of the same image again when the copper position is at about the middle of the screen, so the image display gets restarted at that position. We do this with the wait instruction and the reset of BPLCon0 and the bitplane pointer registers. This is how the result looks like on the Amiga. We are at the end of this episode. Thank you so much for your time. The source code for this episode and a few variants with interleaved image data are available on GitHub. You can find all the relevant links in the video description. Until next time, happy hacking!